Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. That's, I've been to many churches. That's actually probably the best good morning I've ever received, believe it or not. <laughs> Maybe that's just because it was me. I don't know. <laughs> but thank you so much. Thank you guys for, for the music. I appreciate the worship. Um, you guys have a very talented uh, core of musicians here. And, um, and it's just great. It's great to be here. Um, it's good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Brother Don asked me if I would update you guys on um, some things involving the powerhouse, powerhouse here in Washington, Indiana. So as you guys know, our mission at the powerhouse is uh, to build relationships with junior and senior high youth in order to share the gospel. Now, when we do this, we get the opportunity to hear many stories. And it seems like this past month, per se, the stories have, have, have been building and, uh, and it's been heartbreaking. Stories of molestation, stories of abandonment, stories of chaos at home, and many other things. You know, when, with these stories, though, come the opportunity for us to share the gospel, come the opportunity for us to lead them back to our Creator, to show them who God is. And so right now, um, at this moment, we have about 30 teens that are, that are coming every day uh, to the after school program, and that's during the cold uh, weather that we've had here and there. Um, and it seems like no matter how cold it is, the boys still go outside and they still play basketball. And, uh, and I, I catch myself, I'm getting old, I'm getting old. And I catch myself looking at them and I'm thinking, these they're nuts, what are they doing? And then I remember that I did the same thing, so I was the one shoveling off the pavement so I could play basketball in, uh, in the freezing cold. And my dad was probably like, this guy's nuts. And, uh, and I was. Um, so, but, but right now we have about 30 teens. We have a, a program at the high school or the junior high called TRT, which means the real truth. And we get about 10 minutes during lunch uh, to share the gospel with, with the junior high kids in the high school on Thursdays. Um, at that time, we have, uh, they split them up, boys and girls, uh, but total, we have about 100 teens showing up um, every day or every Thursday to hear the gospel. Um, so it's been pretty amazing uh, to watch. So what I would ask, uh, well, one more thing that we're in the middle of that I don't think I've, I've shared uh, publicly here, but we are actually um, in the middle of a fundraiser for a building campaign to build a new building. Uh, so you can imagine with uh, 30 kids, sometimes 50 kids showing up at the powerhouse and we have a dining room table that fits eight um, and we feed them every day that, that we have our stairs that go upstairs are usually packed with kids sitting on the stairs eating or if it is a little bit warmer they're on the, the deck eating or they're in the living room sitting on the floor. Uh, with, the, with the new powerhouse building we actually uh, would be able to set 80 uh, in the building that, that we have drawn up. So we're in the middle of that. Um, the city has, has come on board even and, and helped some of that fundraising efforts out uh, with us. Um, and I do have a meeting with the county uh, coming up this week, so please pray for that uh, next week. So it won't be this coming week, but the following week. So please pray for that. Um, we are about halfway uh, with the funding um, for a, the whole entire building, um, but we're only about fifty dollars to $100,000 away from being able to build the shell of the building. And so we're getting really close uh, to that. So please, please be praying for that. But, but one thing I would ask from you guys, if you would, um, to continue to, to fervently pray for us, to pray for our staff, to pray for the teens, to pray for the families in this community. You can imagine that hearing these stories um, can weigh uh, on our hearts, can weigh on our minds. Um, there's some sleepless nights at times um, of us just thinking about that. The good news is, though, is that we, me, I can't save anyone, but I know who can, and I know who to save and so we're just praying, seeking the Lord, that He would draw them uh, closer to Him. So if you would, join us in praying for that. Um, that His saving grace would continue uh, there. And that He would grant us wisdom um, as, as we deal with these, these issues and these things. So today, <clears throat> I'd like to call your attention uh, this morning to the book of Romans. Romans chapter 3. <clears throat> Romans chapter 3. Verses 23 through 24. If you would, 
Uh, and if you're able, once you get there, would you, would you please stand uh, for the reading of God's Word? Romans 3, 23. <clears throat> I got something in my throat. Romans 3, 23 through 24. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we thank You so much for Your Word. God, we thank You that You saw fit to give us 66 books that we can read, that we can learn, that we can know, that it can correct us, it can rebuke us, it can teach us and train us and equip us for good works. God, we pray that as we, as we dive into your word, God, that you would open our hearts to see more of who you are and what you've done for people like me, for people like us, once sinners, now saved by grace. God, we, we thank you that you put us here in Davis County and we pray for our community. We pray for Davis County that, <clears throat> that you would rise us up to be a city on a hill that, that our light would shine uh, for all to see. That, that our good works would be shown that it would glorify you in heaven. God, that you would set us apart even here in Davis County that people would know that this county loves and follows the Lord. God, we praise you and we thank you. It's in your name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I joke because I always have in my outline bold letters with stars. You may be seated because I forget that sometimes. <laughs> and some people sit there late and I just keep going and I, I feel bad. <laughs> so, so it was bold. I got it this morning. So I titled this, this message this morning Sola gratia, or grace alone. Now, some of you know that, that every time I show up here, I've only got one more left after today, so I only get to come back one more time, I guess, and then I don't know what I'll teach, right? Uh, but, but every time I've been here, we've been going through the five solas. I love talking about, learning about the solas. And here's the five solas. We are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, according to God's word alone. So the, these are in the Latin, sola gratia, sola fide, sola Christus, sola scriptura, and sola dea gloria. Now, we've covered so far, at the times that I've been here, um, we covered uh, sola scriptura, sola dea gloria, and sola fide, but today we're going to focus on sola gratia, or grace alone. And, and some of you know that um, coming here, and actually, I, first of all, John Edwards' name is just amazing. I, I told him that before because I love reading about John Edwards. Um, not this guy, but that's his name, right? I pointed because I think he usually sat there. Um, and, and now he's your intern pastor. It's amazing. So, but I love reading and, and going and learning about the Reformers and the Puritans. Guys like Jonathan Edwards, John Knox, Martin Luther, John Calvin, William Tyndale, John Owen, John Bunyan. John was such a big name back then. John Wycliffe. I love to hear of these great men and, and what they stood for and how they stood on the Word of God, even in the midst of trials, even in the midst of governments coming at them. You know, many of them died standing on the Word of God. Many of them got beaten, got burned at the stake. Some of them literally just for translating our, the Word that God's given us for translating that into English so that English people could understand and hear it from, from Latin. Many of them got burnt at the stake for this reason. And I think, I think Martin Luther summed it up best when he said this. My conscience, this is, well real quick, a little background. Martin Luther hung up his 95 theses, right? And it, 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 that's how they started a debate. That, that was part of it. Well, he wasn't any different than anybody else. He, he, had, he saw something wrong. He wanted to debate about it. So just like everybody, he hung it up on the church doors and he posted his 95 theses and they brought him in to the court, to the church. And they were asking him to recant his statements. And Martin Luther says this, and I believe all the Puritans and all the Reformers would 100% agree with this statement. My conscience is captive to the Word of God. 
Thus I cannot and I will not recant. Because acting against one's conscience is neither safe nor sound. Here I stand. I can do no other. God help me. You see, it's from these great men that we come to realize these five solas in Scripture. They, 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 put a, they brought them out so clearly and put them in a form that we can easily read the five solas, the foundations of salvation, the foundations of the gospel taught in Scripture. That's why I love preaching about them. I love teaching them and I love studying them. You see, these men in their day were in direct conflict with the Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church, the Greek. They were in the England Catholic Church, the Church of England. They were in direct conflict with these by saying just the first one that I mentioned today, the one we're going to be teaching on, one statement set them apart and made them an enemy of the Catholic Church. And that is, we are saved by grace alone. You see, even kings and queens try to, to stop this. By saying we are saved by grace alone, they were saying that no works could ever save us. That it was nothing in us that led to salvation. It wasn't faith plus works. No, it was grace through faith. And these men stood on this doctrine and had nothing to gain for themselves by standing on this. However, the Catholic Church did have much to lose by this statement, grace alone. You see, they applied heavy burdens to the church, to the people, by adding that it was works that you must be saved. That if you did enough good, it would cancel out evil. And some of the good works, they even said, hey, it involved money. And they said, hey, if you paid enough of your penance, then God would forgive you. And they used this money to get kings and queens usually on their side. So these reformers and these Puritans had nothing to gain for themselves, but the doctrine of grace alone had much to gain in freeing the people. Not freeing them from works. We'll, we'll talk about that later but freedom of the gift of salvation. So let's dive into our text this morning. Let's, let's dive into Romans chapter 3, verse 23. We're going to start with what it starts with. <clears throat> For all have sinned. Paul's writing this letter to, to the, the church in Rome, the Christians in Rome. And he said, For all have sinned. See, what Paul's saying here is actually he's calling attention to the ultimate problem of man, of mankind. Since the fall of man in Genesis 3, man has had a great dilemma. In fact, if we look just a few verses up uh, in Romans, and you, and you see in, in, verse, uh, or in chapter 3, verse 10 through 12, Paul quotes actually David in Psalms 14 and in Psalms 53. And Paul says this in Romans 3.10. He says, as it is written, no one is righteous. None is righteous, not no one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. Verse 12, all have turned aside together. They have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. And that is our problem. This is our dilemma. We are sinful creatures and have grieved a holy God. And no one can do good. Paul says the same thing, actually, as he's writing in Ephesians. In Ephesians uh, chapter 2, 1, he says, And you were dead in your trespasses and sin. You see, we were born this way, every single one of us. Look at our text. Paul says, For all have sinned, and what? We've fallen short of the glory of God. All have sinned, and we've fallen short of the glory of God. What is this glory that God has? What is the glory of God? 
Well, I'll be honest with you. You'd want me to be, right? <coughs> the glory of God is actually something I find quite almost impossible to define. This is something that's so vast, this side of Jesus' return, that I don't know if we're going to grasp fully, ever. I mean, listen to this in Isaiah uh, chapter 6, verse 3. And one called on the other, talking about an angel, right? The angels are talking, and, and one of the angels called on another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled of His glory. The angel says the whole earth is filled with His glory. So here I am, me, trying to put into human words, into English, something that has filled the whole earth, and it's God's glory. It's so vast, it's so infinite. And not just this earth, but, but David in, in Psalms 19 writes, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims His handiwork. So not only earth is filled with His glory, all of heaven is filled with His glory. And yet I, trying to tell you what glory is. But, but I think I have to, at least try. Um, but the good news is, is I didn't come up with it. I, I used someone else who I think described it way better than what I think I could have come up with. And, and that, his name is John Piper. Some of you guys might know John Piper. John Piper took a stab at this. And, and he said this, he said, the glory of God is infinite beauty and greatness of God's holiness. Let me repeat that. The glory of God, so what is God's glory? It's the infinite beauty and greatness of God's holiness. Guys, and it's this right here that Paul says we've fallen short of. We have fallen short of the infinite beauty and greatness of God's holiness. The whole earth and all of heaven show God's vastness, shows His glory. But yet we have fallen short of that as humans. I've shared this before, but the Westminster Shorter Catechism asks a question. And it says, what is the chief end of man? And the answer to that question is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. If that's true, then Paul's saying that we, the created humans, that God created to glorify Him, have fallen short of that purpose. Because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But Paul doesn't stop here in Romans, does he? Praise God that he doesn't. Paul doesn't stop here in our sinful state. But no, he goes on. In verse 24, he says, And are justified by his grace as a gift. So in verse 23, Paul says, We have a problem. Every one of us have sinned and fallen short. We, God created us to glorify Him, yet we cannot, we do not glorify Him. We have a problem. But then Paul doesn't leave us at our problem. And he says the solution is we are justified. We are justified. Now honestly, I think justify, justification has been rightly and then also wrongly even in our day and in other days applied um, to salvation. Some of us and some people, some teachers think that, that you have to have a continual justification. That as you live, you are continually being justified. And I think, they, what, I think some of the problem is, is maybe some people just get mixed up with sanctification and justification, right? Because sanctified, we're continually being sanctified. We're continually being renewed of our minds. And God and the Holy Spirit are working in that, renewing us and, and drawing us closer to Him. And we're becoming more like Christ. However, we are once and for all justified. And we're justified as an act 
act of God's grace that is a free gift given to us. Whereas he pardons all of our sins and accepts us as righteous in his sight through Christ's righteousness, imputed, meaning given to us, and received by faith alone. You know, so here we have, we have Paul who, who's saying there's a problem, we are sinners, but, but there's a solution, and, and it's, it's justified. God, God's grace justified. But how are we justified? How can this be? Well, Paul continues, and he says, we are justified, here's how, by God's grace as a gift. Paul is ultimately making a statement saying it is not by your works. You could do nothing, nothing. You, you could do all the good works you think are good and great, and yet that is not what saves you. Paul says it again in, in, in Ephesians in chapter 2. He talks about our sinfulness, our selfishness. We read that. You know, we're dead in our sin and trespasses in Ephesians. But that, that's verses 1 and 3, setting up the, the bad. And again, he gives us the good um, in 4 to 6. But God, he says. Ephesians 2, 4 through 6, he starts off. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, He made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up with Him and seated us with Him in a heavenly place in Christ Jesus. Every time I read that, I think I forget the other part, which is, which is saved by grace through faith, which He says later, right? So it's interesting to me that here, in the same chapter, but just a little bit before He says grace through faith, the sins that he has in verse 5. He says, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. And he breaks the sentence there. And it's odd that he breaks it there. And he, and he says, by grace you have been saved. And raised us up with him and seated. So if I take out that by grace we are saved, you can see that the sentence actually reads better. Right? So even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ and raised us up with Him and seated us with Him in the heavenly places. His thought is continual there. But for, for, for a purpose, for a reason that Paul saw fit, he broke the sentence to add in, by grace you have been saved. And he did it because he knows and we still know to this day that we as humans try to earn it. He knew who he was talking to. He knew the church in Ephesus. And he knew they needed that break. That he had to make sure that what he was saying wasn't going to get confused with all of the works you might try to do to earn your salvation. But it's God's grace alone because of His love for us that we are saved. Church, it's important that we get this. We have preachers today, we have priests today, going around telling people, preaching that you have to do good things to earn your salvation. Guys, we have people saying that speaking in tongues will save you. We have people saying that baptism saves you. There's whole denominations built on those things. We have priests that will say, come to me, confess your sins, I will forgive you, and, and I will petition to God that, that He would do this. Except during COVID, by the way, just throw that out there. You could do it on your own during COVID, but, but before that you had to come to them, right? Um, but come, to, come, come do these, pray these things, pray to other people, pray, and they leave out and they don't add to, they don't even look at scripture that says, it's by grace you have been saved. And it's a free gift that God has given you. Books, you can go to, I don't, does Vineyard still exist in Evansville? But you can go to online, you can look up Christian books. Books written on, written on things that apply to a works salvation.
And I wonder sometimes, did they just forget to read Paul? Did they just forget the whole New Testament? Where are they getting these things? We have people that come up with analogies, right? And the analogies, here, here's one that, that I hear a lot. Um, they'll tell stories of, of God, he's sitting, he's, you're in a courtroom, and you picture a courtroom, and God is sitting on, the, he's in the judgment seat, he's the judge, which he is, by the way. There's some truth to some of this, but it goes off the rails. But he's sitting on the judgment seat, and he's about to, to condemn you to hell, he's about to give you the sins that we all deserve. And Jesus runs in at the last minute, and he says, no, I'll take his place. And if it hadn't been for Jesus running in at the last minute, then we were going to hell. That it was Jesus who came in. And there's some truth to that, but, it, but it's twisted. Because here, this, that's actually a false view of what Scripture is trying to say. Because it's putting God up on the judgment seat as the, the, the mean judge that's going to cast you into hell. Which, by the way, He has a wrath and we do deserve His wrath. But, but we see throughout Scripture that it's by God's grace that He sent His Son. His son didn't just run in at the last minute and say, hold on, hold on, God, hold on, I'll, I'll do it, I'll take it. No, but actually from the beginning of time, God set it up that his son would be our salvation. It wasn't just like, see, one of these, actually that whole scenario that I gave you is in direct contradiction to the most famous verse we've all know, which is John 3.16. And John 3.16 says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Not that his son ran in at the last minute. Not only that, Ephesians 2, 4, what we've already read. But God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he has for us. Our text, Romans 3, 24 says, we are justified by God's grace as a gift. You see the difference there? One points that, that, that Jesus came in as an option. And the other points to God's sanctification, or God's, um, I just lost the word, sorry, but um, I was going good, huh? Um, but God's sovereignty, not sanctification, we already talked about that, but God's sovereignty, it points to the fact that Jesus was always God's plan A. There was no plan B, C, D, or E, that from the beginning of time, John, if you open up the gospel and you read the book of John, the first, first chapter it's all about how Jesus was there from the beginning of time. And He is the Word. Sinclair Ferguson says it this way. He said, God is not gracious to me because Jesus died for me. But instead, Jesus Christ died for me because God is gracious to me. Let me read it again. Look for the difference. God is not gracious to me because Jesus died for me. But Jesus Christ died for me because God is gracious to me. Church, there's a difference. There's a difference. And we have to be sure that we're teaching and we're preaching it correctly. You see, we are saved by God's grace that was gifted through His Son. His Son didn't just step in and say, I'll do this. No, but He was sent by God to do it. Because of His mercy. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. You see, the gift of grace is through the redemption found in Christ. God sending His Son is a gift of grace to us. Now we can be justified. We now can be holy. We now can be righteous. So that now we can be with God. Because apart from being righteous, apart from being holy, apart from being justified, we cannot be in the presence of a holy God. We cannot Live a life with a righteous God. Is it not this 
this doctrine of grace, this, this realization of God's justification given to us, incredible. Is it not something that, that we should be shouting about? Is it not something that, that we should sing loudly about? And that we should tell the masses of all we come in contact with of. That we now have the gift of grace from God through His Son. Yes, I know we're still sinners. Yes, I, I know we are not righteous. But it's because of God that He has made us righteous through His Son. And that deserves an amen, right? That gets me excited. That's what gets me up in the morning. That's what makes me want to keep going into the powerhouse to see these kids who are in a hopeless state. That their parents, some of them, some of them, they didn't even do anything. Their parents put them in this. But yet knowing that their parents and them both were all born sinful. We're all born into sin. But that God, rich in His mercy, would send His Son for us. You see, it isn't by our works. Man, if it was, have you ever read through the Old Testament? Abraham messed up constantly. But it was counted to him as righteousness, his obedience when God asked and God told. You get, you get his son, Isaac, falls in the same, some of the same traps that he did. He, Abraham lied to say his, his wife was his, his sister, and he was halfway true. Isaac had no truth to it, but yet still did the same thing, right? And then you have Jacob. Jacob walking around pretty, pretty cocky, pretty confident in himself with this nice new jacket on, right? But his life was literally depicted by God. And he looks at his brothers and they sold him into slavery and, and, he, and he's up there and he worked his way up and back down and worked his way back up just by being confident in the Lord, just by working, just by being um, a man that wanted to, to live righteously. People would raise him up because they trusted him. They had faith in what he would do and then lies happened. But then he got all the way up and he looked at his, at his brothers who came to him knowing what they had done. That they had sold him into slavery and he could look at him and he said... What you meant for evil, God meant for good. You go, David, the things that David did, if it was by works, how in the world can David be set there and God would say, this is a man after my own heart? You look at all of Israel, and they turn their backs on God, and it didn't take long. And we can look at them sometimes and point fingers at, at them, you know, as they were going out of Exodus with Moses, and, and they're out here, and, and they're eating manna, the same thing every day, right? And then if they don't handle it rightly, they get too much, and it spoils, and it stinks, and, and, and they're looking at it, it's hot, and they're looking at it and saying, man, I feel like we live better in slavery. Forgetting what God has done for them. If it was by works, none of them could be saved. And if it was by works, none of us could be saved. You see, for some of us, even this grace, this gift that God gave us by His grace, gets a little bit uncomfortable. And our human minds can't quite figure it out because, you know, some of us, most of us, I would say, in this room, were brought up um, in a household that, that disciplined them. At least I was thankful for that. Um, but but it, it made like if I did good, I got praised, and if I did bad, I got punishment. And it should have been that way, right? But sometimes we, we then put that on on our heavenly Father, and we think that well, I got to do so much good so that so I can receive His praise. But we've got to realize that God gave us this as a free gift. I'm here to tell you guys that we can do nothing. Hear me say this, nothing to be righteous and nothing holy enough. But what about this works thing? Because there is something to do with works. And I think I would be remiss if I didn't talk about works. Since our sin is covered because of the grace, and, 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 and even in 
people in, in Scripture, Paul was saying, hey, actually, the more there's sin, the more there's grace. It abounds more. So should we then not care at all about works? Should we say that, hey, if good works and bad works don't please God, well then why not just do the bad? Why not just do whatever I'd like? But Paul says that in Romans 6 too. He said, by no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? See, our works do not save us. But we are saved for good works. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Not as a result of works. So that none of us can boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. Which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Titus 3, 5 through 8. He saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy, by the washing and regenerating and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that being justified by His grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Paul continues, that the saying is trustworthy, and I want you to insist on these things. So that this who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable for people. So although we are not saved by good works, good works should flow out of us because of our salvation. Why should we have good works at all? Matthew 5.16 says, in the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So why must we, why might we have good works? Why is that important after salvation, after God has saved us, to, to devote ourselves to these things, to good works? So that God's glory would be known. So that they would glorify Him in heaven. So it should be known that my works do not save me. Hear me say that. Works do not save me. But because of God's salvation, I do good works, and they should call others to glorify Him. Guys, isn't this a beautiful thing? Isn't this awesome? Our God, our Lord, our King, our Creator, before the beginning of time, saw fit out of His love for us to show grace to us. By sending His Son to live a perfect life and to die a sinner's death to become our sin, even though He knew no sin, so that we may become God's righteousness. And because of His grace in our salvation, He made us for good works to glorify Him. What is the chief end of man? To glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. Guys, such good news is God's grace. Such good news is it to be found in Him. And as, as the musicians and, and as Russ comes up, I want to close by saying that if any, any are here who have never accepted God's grace or who have, have worked so hard to do good works never knowing true salvation is through Christ, is through God's grace. Then well, I'll be here, I'll be in the back, be here. Um, there's others that, that are here um, that would love to talk with you, love to pray with you because you'll never know of the riches of His glory without His grace. Let's pray. Father, we are thankful for your grace. God, we're thankful uh, that, that here I am preaching a message on grace at a church called Grace. And God, I pray that you would, you would impart in us a knowledge of wisdom that only comes from you about who you are and the salvation that you've given. God, we love you. We praise you. It's in your name. Amen.